Hey, good morning, everyone. So just a, just a quick uh, continue on from yesterday's class. I just wanted to talk about one specific issue before we move on away from this example. I'm kind of glad we spent some of the time on it yesterday, so you got to see some of the thinking required for the project. And related to that, in your project, make sure you document your thought process. Don't just put on a PID with all your loops and 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 control sequencing, but make sure you emphasize in your written report why you've done so, right? so I can understand what your thought process was to get to that final stage. Okay, so uh, make sure that that's documented in a clear manner in the project. I, the point I wanted to raise just on this case study was related to um, control. So I won't go through the startup sequence, we covered that amply yesterday. I just wanted to talk about regular control of this system during normal operation. So we've, start, we've started up already, we're operating, and our target is so that this set point here is 225 degrees Celsius. And the topic I want to address here is on controllability. Because you have a similar question in the tutorial asking about two heat exchanges. And when you look at controllability of a process, there's five issues that we really do consider. We want fast dynamics, high gain, linear, and a symmetric behavior, if possible. And goes without saying we want that control loop to be set. Okay. So this is what I want to address based on this example. So I hadn't intended to use this example for this, but it works really well. And the control loop I specifically want to talk about is this control of the temperature to the end of the reactor. And we had proposed this control loop in yesterday's class. We said we're going to control this inlet temperature by opening and closing this bypass valve. Now, in the meetings we had with, with almost all groups, oftentimes when we were talking about control loops, one of the proposals to manipulate often ended up being manipulate this flow into the into reactor. So oftentimes that comes up as a suggestion. Let's change the flow into the system. So if we look back at this example, we can we, let's just ask the hypothetical question, can we change this flow rate up and down to affect that inlet temperature to the reactor? Is there a cause and effect relationship between the flow rate and related to the temperature going into the reactor. <coughs> Think about it for a minute. If I vary that temperature, sorry, if I vary this flow, will I change the inlet temperature? So up or down, Because we're sending less material into the reactor, then we may not have 
as much heat release because more, like you, you're increasing the flow. So the increase the flow of feed into the reactor. Yeah. Um, there's less resonance line in your right. So that it, it releases less heat to your output. F1 would be a little bit lower. Okay. So, so less resonance line in the reactor may be lower temperature. Okay. But um, <coughs> the, the hot F1 temperature doesn't really matter because that second heater will heat it up to 225. Okay, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just considering this, but oh, no, okay. I, I see where it's, so back yesterday we had that second heat exchange to make up the addition. Just talking about this loop as is, or as shown here, if I vary this flow, right, it's a nice idea to vary this flow because we don't have to add anything else to our process. If I vary this flow, I can manipulate this temperature. There is a cause and effect relationship. If you recall that in a heat exchange, Q equals MCP dt, or delta t, log mean, that m is the mass flow. So if that mass flow changes through this loop, so slower flow or higher flows, I'm going to vary q, exchange in that heat exchanger. If q varies, cp says constant delta t must change. It must transfer more or less heat to that stream leaving here. So you will be able to vary this temperature by adjusting the flow. But why is that not a good idea? So there's this potential to create a control loop between this flow. So this, I'd, I'd like to maybe use this flow to manipulate that temperature. Why is it not a good idea? Take a look at those five points over there, or think about some other ideas. I think it just be this dynamics would be really slow because you have to go all the way through the reactor at this time to get that around. So it's a long uh, dead time with delay connecting. Okay, so slower dynamics might make that less appealing. Okay, so if you change the flow, you have to wait for that flow change to pass through the heat exchanger, through the reactor, come back around that you exchange heat and then you see the, the, the temperature effect later on. Great. We're trying to maximize your product, so you don't really want to slow down your flow. Okay. It's, this flow rate is in your major product line. And if we're a pusher of process, we're receiving this material from upstream, we have to deal with it. We cannot back it up. Right? So changing this flow up and down is not an option for us in most instances because we have to take what we get from our upstream units. Because there's two very good reasons why that control loop wouldn't be a sensible choice. It certainly does work, it can work, but it's not going to be useful for us. So slow dynamics, and we just cannot do it from that, from the principle of backing up our operation. So we looked at this then as an alternative yesterday, or we proposed this loop, <coughs> where we're saying let's open and close this valve over here to affect this temperature. Cause and effect relationship between that valve position and the temperature. Yes or no? Absolutely. Okay. Does it have fast dynamics? If I open the valve, how long is it going to be before I see a change over here? That's what dynamics refers to. Fast dynamics, slow dynamics. Extremely fast dynamics. You open that valve almost instantaneously, you'll see a change in that temperature. Okay, fluid typically flows in pipes around a meter per second if it's liquid, vapor phase 30 meters per second. So very, very quick change in that valve position to seeing a change in temperature. Is there a high gain? or a low gain. <coughs> what do we mean by gain? Okay, there is a high gain. The gain refers to by how much do you make a change in the in the inputs, so in other words this valve position, and then the corresponding change you see in the temperature. Okay, so small changes in this valve position will lead to changes in that temperature. A low gain system means that you have to make a lot of change in your input to get some sort of change in your output. Whereas a high gain system means small changes in your input, you get a correspondingly large change in your output. So we like high gain systems so we can do less work for lots of benefit. Linear. Linear systems refer to the fact that if I make a change here, 
by say 10%, 10% change in the valve position, I might see a two degree increase in temperature. If I make double the change in the valve position, I'll see double the change in the temperature. So a linear effect. We like linear effects as well because we can then work and create control loops, PID, with very good tuning. Non-linear systems, we have to be a little bit more careful about those control loops. Take a bit more work. Symmetric refers to the fact that if I open that valve, I'll see the temperature change. If I close the valve, back again, does it just simply follow that path but in reverse? Okay, so symmetry refers to the path following ability. And we like that as well. Right? The, remember back from your process control course, we're PID controllers, those, those control loops that you designed, there is an assumption of symmet symmetrical behavior in it. Symmetry and linearity go hand in hand. So if the system is linear, it is symmetric. Okay. Guaranteed. And then finally, safe. This is a safe system. There's really not too much that can go wrong here. If there's a temperature disturbance coming in, we can open that valve or close the valve to compensate for it. Okay, there's going to be no undue effect from, from that. So those are the, some of the considerations we need to bear in mind when we look at control and pairing. Let's uh, move on from startup and shutdown. I just want to take a look at this quick example. We're looking at starting up a, a, re, a reboiler and the bottom of the heat exchanger here. Um, this is PP Texas City. So they're filling that, that liquid in the bottom of the tower and they were boiling it up in a loop. But when we start up a, 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 a distillation column, at the bottom of the tower, we don't have vapor going back up. We're just starting up that tower. So out of my reboiler here, there's no vapor, vapor phase because I've got no liquid in here yet. Okay, so this is what this uh, this picture is actually a little bit wrong. There's this liquid over here doesn't when you're just starting up the, the tower, you don't have that, that liquid sitting there waiting for you. This liquid comes from the down cover. But when we're just starting up the reactor, we're just going to get liquid weeping down and accumulating in the bottom over here. So we've got no liquid in our reboiler. So what we need to do is add add a bypass valve here. So when the liquid comes in, you're just pouring liquid into the tower, it's accumulating in the bottom. We need to get liquid into this thermal siphon reboiler so we can start to heat up that liquid to create the vapor phase that will then get out the tower again. So just a, this is just a small thing to bear in mind for a particular geometry at the bottom of the distillation column. When you've got no liquid in that pan over there, we need to provide liquid to the thermosiphon reboiler. What is a thermosiphon reboiler? <coughs> thermosiphon reboilers are one way we can get away without having a pump at the bottom of that column. So to pump that liquid into a heat exchanger, um, we would normally have a pump required over there. But a thermosiphon reboiler uses the principle that if we're putting liquid in here, boiling it up, it goes to vapor. That vapor is going to leave out at the top and create a vacuum and pull more liquid in for us. So we're getting that transfer of liquid through that reboiler without a pump. So we're, if we can do it, we, we'd like to do that. Here's some more examples that you can go look on the web. Um, so here's liquid at the bottom of the column. We put it in. It comes here in this particular drawing. It's on the shell side. And on the tube side, we have steam coming in and condensate leaving on the tube side. This liquid, as it's, as it's immersed around the tubes, is going to boil, vaporize, and then you send that back, or it goes up by itself based on the density difference. It drives itself through the system. Here's an example on this side where the liquid goes on the tube side this time and rises up the tubes as a, as a vapor liquid mixture and enters back into the column with steam or heating fluid on the shell side. 
So the system totally drives itself, no pump required. Okay, so let's take a look at another example of starting a shutdown. Here's two units in a process. <coughs> Many times we can look at flow sheet and we can group a whole lump of units together into one section, another whole section. And you often, if you look at a flow sheet from a company like you've done in your methanol synthesis, there's four sections that kind of hang together. And they're linked usually by one stream going from the one section to the other section. So here we've got unit A, we've got a pack bed reactor, some separation occurring, this bottom here has been heated, that bottom stream then goes into some sort of reactor. So this hot liquid or gets reacted in some sort of CSTR type unit. This liquid then goes over to a distillation column, the bottom again goes through some sort of pack bed reactor and some separation steps. Now, occasionally we need to shut down, let's say, this distillation column, or this biopeter needs to have some maintenance performed on it. We don't want to shut down unit B when we shut down parts of unit A. So what can we do in this instance? What, what can we add or change to our process? Entire plant, if possible. So, what what can we perhaps add here to to increase our ability to maintain operation? It's not a tough one. <laughs> Any suggestions? Bypass the reactor or bypass the, uh, the, the heater because you want to do this on that. Okay. So, so but then if you need another heater. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Any other other way? So if we if we're going to shut down all of units A, so let's say if we're shutting down the heater, we don't have a backup heater, so we say okay, we'll just shut down all of this. If we don't want to shut down all of B, what what might we do? Right. Uh, you can add a storage vessel between unit A and unit B so that you can fill it up with the product from unit A and keep it at some sort of set level. Okay. And then if so, if unit A is just down, you can operate still using that. Okay, so the suggestion from Brian is to add some sort of storage tank in the middle of it there. Kevin? You just want to isolate the two units, drive valves so that you can uh, shut down one unit and then the other unit you want to use that for. Okay, so if you have you have isolation valves, but you won't be able to operate unit B if unit A is shut down. You would also need the storage. The storage vessel, and this other way around as well. If unit B needed maintenance done, um, but then unit A can still keep operating if you have this intermediate storage tank. So an intermediate storage tank can work for you in both ways. If you need to shut down unit A, or if you need to shut down unit B. Okay, so. If you, if you drive past um, any sort of refinery, you'll often see that. So you'll see this sort of thing, right? Um, any refinery, you'll see plenty, plenty of these large storage vessels hanging around. Okay, so several intermediate storage vessels here. And those vessels are sized so that they can accommodate this intermediate flow. They're not all just the feedstock or the final product waiting to be shipped. So many of those vessels, their purpose is for intermediate storage in the flow sheet for startup and shutdown sequencing. Okay? So we also need some additional equipment though. If we're going to shut down unit A and we've got this tank now of material, unit B, however, expects hot stream from this reactor normally. So normally leaving out of this reactor is a hot stream. Now you've got the storage vessel, well you, you're going to need a pump to provide the pressure difference that you normally would have had, and you're also going to need a heat exchanger. 
to preheat that feed to the required temperature. Conversely, if Unit B is shut down for operation, uh, for maintenance, and only Unit A is running, we don't want to send hot material to our storage vessel. So we have to cool that down as well. <coughs> okay, so that's showing shutdown. Anything else that's required with under regular operation? We've added this now to our flow sheet. We'll start and shut down. What? Anything else that's missing for regular? Um, like high level alarm on the tank or the level alarm. Okay, so level alarms on the tank for sure. Where do we maintain that tank level during regular operation? So if we're shutting down unit A, we would fill up that tank so that we can keep operating B. Yeah, the but if you have like an emergency shutdown or something breaks, you still want to know that you have enough for long enough to fix it, but you don't have so much that it costs a lot of money to build the tank. So hold it all. Okay, so there's a trade-off between storing that, that material and, and enough material for the duration of the shutdown. So an economic trade-off over there. But should that tank now be filled at 25%, 50%, 80%? What should the level in the tank be during regular operation? So an emergency comes, an emergency doesn't announce itself that like I'm going to occur four hours from now. An emergency happens, you shut down right away. So you need to keep that tank at some sort of backup level. Could you take a ratio of the rate in and pull the rate out and then fill it up to that level? So, yeah. so rate in, rate out, if it's operating normally, should be steady, right? Okay, but I, what else might you <coughs> use to decide where the height of that tank should be stored at? Is the reliability of unit A or unit B? So if like, unit A is more likely to shut down, then you might want more unit. Right there, because you know, we need it. But if you need the space because you reach us down more often, then you probably want it to be less. Okay, absolutely. So if unit B is more prone to failure than unit A, so B fails more often than A does, you want to leave that tank empty or empty ish so that you've got the capacity to fill it up while unit B is being repaired. Okay, so the level of the tank it would be at 50% if both <coughs> units had equal probability of failure. But if one unit has greater probability of failure than the other, you make a compensating change in the tank level. So it's not just always a pure 50% middle of the range. And then finally, one other piece of equipment that you'll add is certainly add a bypass around that, that because you certainly don't want to cool down, pump, and heat up again under regular operation. That would be thermodynamically inefficient. So I have a bypass around all of that for regular operation. Uh, I think yesterday you mentioned you can't store gas. So what would we do in that situation? Okay, we can't store gas. What would we do in that situation? That's why we have coolers that you can condense it to a liquid. Okay, so gas is, if, if it was critical, you would compress and liquefy. But that's super expensive. Okay, so the gas phase systems, we often don't have that luxury to build intermediate storage tanks. Okay, so compressing a gas and cooling it down, compressing it, can often be costly. But if it's worth the money to keep up, to have that capacity, for sure you build it in. But in many cases, that can be pretty expensive to add. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on from start of the shutdown and talk a bit about um, another type of transition we often see on the process, and that's regeneration. So catalysts, catalysts get regenerated. You use in this course project catalyst life as a long term, but there's many catalysts whose lifetime is only a day or two and sometimes a few weeks. So those catalysts are continually losing the activity, they get regenerated and returned back to the system. So for a period of time that that catalyst needs to be regenerated, and often that regeneration is in place. So in the reactor, we can add steam or we can add 
some sort of chemical to reactivate the catalyst or clean it up. In other cases, we have to shut down the reactor, totally remove the catalyst and, and, and clean it up and replace it back in again. So every time we do this, the unit is shut down. Um, adsorption, so people taking 4M, we're going to cover adsorption in the next class. Uh, this is a separation step where you're removing material by adsorbing it onto a solid, like a zeolite or a carbon, and that adsorbent has a finite life and a finite capacity, similar to a catalyst, and it needs to be regenerated as well. Uh, we'll, I'll show you an example here where we can coat surfaces due to carbon, so coking in a reactor or due to a polymer contamination, we need to stop cleaning that off periodically, or filtration, such as a membrane, we need to periodically clean that by back flushing. So every time we do that, we have to stop the process. Our upstream units and our downstream units still operate. So how do we deal with that? Um, let's take a look at some options. Well, we've seen already how we, we might deal with that with parallel units. So what we will typically do if we have, say for example, filtration where we need to back flush or an adsorbent that we need to regenerate, we will have that happening in one unit. So we'll shut this unit down for cleaning while the material flows through the second reunit. So all sorts of one-way valves over here. So think back to that example that we had a few classes back. All sorts of one-way valves that we require in that situation to prevent the flow going the wrong way while the one unit is being regenerated. Or another alternative is, especially for liquid processes, we can have storage tanks on either side of that so we can so let's say we shut down that, that unit for, for maintenance, for regeneration, we can accumulate material in that tank and then send it on after this. Okay, so so either either option could work to provide continuous operation. And then sorry, just this tank here is, is required so that while this unit is shut down, we pre-fill that tank, then we can send material from that tank to the downstream operations. So for the period of time, while we're regenerating that unit, this tank is filling up, while that tank is emptying out. So that, this one will have slight, this option here will have lower overall capital cost for you. Because you just need to buy one of those, one of those units. Okay, let's take a look at an example here. Here's an ethane um, or ethylene plant. Uh, we take our hydrocarbons from various sources and we blend them up, so mix them in particular ratios, and those hydrocarbons get sent to a heater where we crack them. And uh, those, the gases from, from cracking, so in the fire heater, as it goes through the tubes, will crack those hydrocarbons to smaller molecules, and, they rec and there's quench here to stop the reaction compression, and then we go on to the installation step. But in those tubes, there's a one problem with cracking is that there's a tremendous amount of carbon buildup on, on the interior of those tubes. And as that happens, the temperature on the tube goes higher and higher, and you risk running to a point where you melt the tubes. So that's, uh, that's undesirable. So we monitor the tube temperature extremely carefully. So here on the next slide, I have an example of that. That tube wall temperature is monitored, and then when it gets to a certain threshold point we stop that particular fire heater for a day or so and decoat it. So the decoating step is done um, by introducing steam into that into that fire heater tube and air and we react that coke away to carbon dioxide. That the vapor phase that we don't send on obviously to our rest of our flow sheet, that vapor phase gets exhausted out to the atmosphere. That's carbon dioxide gets exhausted to the atmosphere, and we any unrecovered coke, sorry, any un unreacted coke that comes out as particles gets filtered out of the cycle. So periodically, we have to shut down these fire heaters for a day or two to clean them out, and that's why we have these other scopes. So many times you go to these processes, you see an entire bank of fire heaters side by side, and pretty much there's almost always one of them that's out of um, operation. So here's an example of parallel um, 
parallel five years in order to keep your process running. Another example that we'll sometimes see for regeneration is our, our heat exchangers. We need to clean those up. So they get fouled. And when we have the case where we have only process streams, so I'm taking a cold process stream, I cannot manipulate that flow. And here I have another hot stream coming down and exchanging heat in that heat exchanger. Periodically, I will need to shut down that heat exchanger to clean it out. So we'll add all these valves over here to isolate those heat, that heat exchanger totally from the system. Um, so the for example, in the horizontal run, I'll close this valve, close this valve, but then I need to provide a bypass for that process stream. So that process stream has to keep going. Um, and similarly, this hot process stream can bypass around here while I close this valve and close that valve. Now that heat exchange is totally isolated, I can clean it with, with chemical solution to, to remove the foul and shell it shoots. So uh, where, where you see this then is um, most commonly when you're exchanging heat with two process streams. Okay, then the one final area of transitions I want to talk about, and this leads up to a topic uh, <coughs> that we'll look at next week, is batch operations. So batch operations by their very nature are, are uh, transient. And the reason why I want to talk about, about batch operations today and show you a few examples of it is to help us understand how we link up a transient process with a continuous process. So many times we have batch systems in our process, but then we also have continuous systems. How do we link those two up? And then the other reason why I want you to have a good understanding of batch processes is that many of you will actually work in industries where batch systems are the primary form of production. And we kind of go through most of our undergraduate just looking at continuous processes. We see a little bit of batch in reactor design, but by and large we just focus on continuous processes. So it's important to understand how a batch process works and how we plan for batch processes. So I will talk about batch processes today a little bit and then Chris, your TA, will talk about them in class on Tuesday. He's going to give the lecture on Tuesday next week. Chris is one of the experts here at the University on batch process sequencing. So he's the perfect guy to be giving that, that, that talk. So let's take a look at batch processes. Um, we'll see them widely used in a variety of industries food industry, pharmaceuticals, fine chemicals, semiconductor industry, um, for those of you that go work in the United States and semi-manufacturing, almost is, is everywhere is batch in that industry. Okay, and what batches do is they follow a sequence of steps which we call a recipe. And when we're following this recipe, that batch system is never at steady state. It's always undergoing some sort of dynamic change or some tra transient behavior. So what I'll do is I'll, here's an example, I'll just uh, show you a picture of a typical batch reactor. For those of you going into the 4W stream with the Xerox guys, uh, with Dr. Lieberman and Marco Sabin, you'll have a tour of the Xerox facilities in February. And this is pretty much what it looks like. This isn't Xerox, but um, it looks very, very similar to this. You've got these large stainless steel vessels with multiple ports. Uh, here, this blue casing is the housing for the motor that's driving the impeller inside, the, inside that batch reactor. These ports open to allow various chemicals to be added from a, in a manual manner. But there's also pipe, pipe ports coming in to allow uh, adding and removing of material in, in an automated manner. But very, it, almost always you'll see a, man, a, a manhole on the port under, under the reactor to allow manual dosing and also for the operators to periodically open and check what's going on if it's not a pressurized system. It's funny, when I look at batch reactor recipes, like there'll be 20, 30 steps in the recipe, and some of the recipes say open and keep adding material until foaming stops. Right? So the operator sits there, is opening, checking, adding material until the foaming stops. So very often the batch recipes are, are driven exactly like a recipe that you would be following in the kitchen at home. Okay, so um, batch operations follow that sort of sequencing, and they're, they're almost just large CSTRs. 
So let's take a look at some of the other op operations around them. Um, I just had posted these slides a little bit late yesterday. They're not too serious if you didn't download them and print them out. Um, it's about, about where they're used. This is um, batch reactors. The point of this slide is just to show you the fairly, fairly intricate control systems on these reactors. So we've got a lot of sensors, pressure, temperature, flows. Those are things that can e easily measure. Um, you'll start up the batch by closing the exit pump. So this, this pump is off. There's a valve over here that shuts down the reactor's exit. And we're simply adding feeds to the reactor. Turn on the impeller. And while that reactor is going, we will change the coolant profiles and change the temperatures in the reactor to follow a certain recipe. Uh, here, the, the, it's the same diagram. And I've just added the control systems onto it. Um, this is from the work of a master's student here at the university a few years ago. And she was considering the batch from a control perspective. And she had designed an MPC controller. So those of you that have taken Roger Schwartz's control course and, and the four, fourth year course, you, you cover the topic of MPC. And MPC, Model Predictive Control, tells how to control that reactor from a variety of loops. So here we're controlling temperature, we're controlling pressure. Here we're controlling the profile. So I'll talk about profiles in a minute. We're also controlling the feed ratio. And then those are then sent down to cascade loops to control the set points. And we're also handling sort of some constraints. We cannot, can and cannot do certain things on that temperature profile. So the, what we call here is trajectory tracking. We have to track a trajectory very carefully or track a profile very carefully. So what do I mean by those profiles? Let's take a look at an example. This is from a fine chemicals company in the United States. They've given us their data to look at this batch. And what they're doing is that they're measuring temperature, the temperature set point, the temperature inside the vessel. They're measuring the power, the torque, and then the speed on this motor. So we can measure those three variables easily. We can measure the pressure, the delta pressure, and we can measure the level by carefully. So 10 variables that we can measure. And during the batch, I'm only showing four of those 10 variables here, but those variables will follow a certain trajectory. So during stage one of the recipe, so this entire batch lasts 325 minutes. During that first stage, which is 180 minutes, the first set three hours of the batch, we have this level going up. So the level in that, in that vessel goes up. The agitator speed will have a particular trajectory where we're just simply saying 8 revolutions per minute. So 8 RPM for the agitator speed. The drier temperature follows that trajectory, and then this variable follows that trajectory. So that MPC controller is responsible for making sure these variables follow those trajectories. So it's pretty sophisticated control systems on a batch reactor. In the second stage of the recipe, we ramp up the impeller speed for most of the stage and then have a ramp down at the end. This variable rises up to a peak. Okay? And then some of these other variables just follow whatever trajectory they follow. But whenever you see this sort of clear path followed by a variable, you know that this variable is being controlled in order to achieve that profile. So in the recipe for this batch, the recipe says, Make the temperature go from 25 degrees to 80 degrees within that time window. So it's simply a linear ramp in temperature. That's the profile that, that some engineer or some chemist has figured out ahead of time as being an optimal profile that will lead to the best product. And then the third stage here is a ramp down in temperature. Uh, we change the agitator profile a little bit. We change the other temperatures. So recipes have two, three, five, I've seen recipes with, with more than 20 steps in them. And some batches will last two days. I've worked with systems where the batches last 30 days. So different, different sort of recipes follow for different products. OK, and here, here's another example from DuPont from a nylon polymerization. We've got temperatures, pressures, flows um, in the reactor. And they follow these sort of unusual shapes. 
So here's data from 100 batches, I think, superimposed. So there will be 100 trajectories of previous batches for temperature, 100 trajectories for this temperature, and, and so forth. So you can see very reproducible. Companies like DuPont, they want to make that nylon batch or that latex exactly the same from every batch. So the control of that trajectory is very, very critical for them. So let's go back then to our discussion here on operability. So a batch process, as I said, will dose, will dose our feed into the reactor and we'll react for a period of time, we'll follow the recipe, and then at the end of the batch, we'll have our product leaving. So we'll go from no product leaving here at the exit, we'll have a period of time where that product ramps up to some sort of maximum, whatever our pump can deliver, and then the product suddenly drops to zero. So if we're thinking downstream of this batch reactor, you've got this very variable feed coming in. That's nothing, and then suddenly you get this huge flow of material, and then it's off again. Conversely, upstream from the batch reactor, we've got the expectation that we're only going to fill the batch for a period of time and then shut, shut down that valve. Okay, so whenever you've got a batch system in between continuous units, what are we going to need? How are you going to interface a continuous process either upstream or downstream from a batch system? Multiple storage tanks, for sure, yeah. So a storage tank, if you're just producing one product, multiple storage tanks for producing a variety of products. So that's what Chris's discussion is going to be on next week, Tuesday, is how do we optimally sequence up our batches okay, and storage capacity. Okay, here's a, here's a few more examples of different trajectories. Um, I've shown you some other trajectories, so we don't need to go through these again. But uh, I think the, the one interesting thing about this slide is it shows you that a, this same batch reactor has both heating and cooling. So we'll heat the batch for a period of time, and then we'll apply cooling water for another period of time. So batch processes by this nature, one thing I hope you understand from this is batch processes are extremely inefficient when it comes to energy use. Right, we're always heating up this large vessel of material, then cooling it down, then heating it up, so these, these units are often um, in the order of 30, 40 meters cubed. You've got a large, large volume of material here, and you're heating all of that up, and then you're cooling it all down again in order to follow these temperature profiles. So it's very inefficient from an energy consumption point of view. OK, so then as, as Marissa suggested, we have to interface um, our systems with some sort of Here's an example where we've got an upstream batch process with this variable feed leaving it. So we feed and then there's nothing and then there's some flow and then there's no flow. If the downstream unit is a distillation column, distillation columns require and expect a constant feed over here. So the storage tank that is sized appropriately so that you can contain the output from this batch system for at least probably two batches of material in here. You're going to draw down, and while this is drawing down into the distillation column, the next batch will hopefully finish in time so that you can fill it up again. So that tank there needs to be appropriately sized for that flow. Okay, so just uh, some final thoughts here on this entire topic of transitions is when designing our, our systems, so for example, designing these heat exchanges that we spoke about yesterday, we had this intermediate heat exchange over here, sitting over there, that we operated with electrical heat or steam. That needs to be sized for the most demanding operation experience by the process. Similarly, these tanks over here need to be sized for the most demanding operation. Back a few slides ago when we considered section A and section B of the process, that intermediate storage tank needs to be sized for the worst case of operation. Okay, so we, we need to take that into account when we, when we do those, create those designs. We don't use the average operation, typical operation, otherwise we're going to have insufficient capacity. And then the main other point from, from this topic for transitions is parallel equipment 
so that we can handle that regeneration step. Okay, so have a parallel system or have storage tanks on either side to handle that, that regeneration step. Okay, so starting to notice again, I keep emphasizing this, adding parallel equipment here for regeneration, but whenever you have parallel equipment, you also get improved reliability. Okay, so not only is this topic you should consider these eight topics in isolation of each other. Definitely, every, every time we're adding a change here for one of these reasons, we almost always improve the reasons elsewhere on that. Then just a final point, I just wanted to talk about, uh, this pretty much wraps up this section of the, of the, the course. Um, one final thing just to note is, yesterday, uh, Monday in the tutorial, I was sort of like looking at the back of the class there and all of Dr. Don Woods' stuff when he passed away but uh, got passed on to the university and so there was a lot of these magazines, hydrocarbon processing at the back. It was interesting, the first one I happened to pick up, the editorial in 2007 it was, yeah, June 2007, Reliable Plants Are Never an Afterthought, part one, and the, and the editorial talks about the cost of adding reliability after the fact. So how much more expensive it is to add reliability to a process once it's built, rather than adding it at the design or the initial design step. Also further on, they actually talk about the methanol synthesis and this exact problem we were talking in yesterday's class is the, is the typical design that, that they talk about here in this article. So again, uh, some, uh, one person in the class was emailing me to ask for resources for SDL. When you graduate and leave and keep up with the profession, there's several good magazines to be reading. One is Chemical Engineering that I've been posting articles from. The other is this Hydrocarbon Processing. There's other uh, ones from the British Institution for Chemical Engineers, ICHEMI. So all of these are good, good resources to keep up to date. <coughs> Okay, one final point. This is, I think this is probably my last class I'm giving for 4M. I get a free ride for the rest of the term. I'm going to get guest lectures in for you guys for the rest of the class. Uh, so in other words,